the word vichara when it's used in everyday Pali to describe everyday affairs means evaluation. One of Ajahn Lee's discoveries, or, or main contributions to understanding the Buddhist teachings on concentration, was to point out that it has the same meaning in concentration practice. The reason this is a discovery is because the commentaries define it in a different way. In everyday language, they say it means evaluation, but in the course of meditation you don't evaluate anything, you just stick your thoughts on one topic, and then you maintain your thought on that one topic. And the thought, according to the commentary, doesn't involve any evaluation at all. It's just you keep on thinking, applying the perception to whatever your topic is. But that doesn't help you settle down if you can't settle down. If you actually evaluate what's going on, you can improve the situation. You evaluate the breath, you evaluate the way you're perceiving the breath, the mental images you have of the breath, the way you discuss the breath with yourself, and you make adjustments. So the breath becomes comfortable, the mind can begin to settle down with a sense of ease and well-being. And the mind and the breath can become snug together. That's the point where you don't have to evaluate things anymore, then you can just settle in. But as John Lee pointed out, the evaluation there is the beginning of discernment. You don't just accept things as they are. You ask yourself, what's going wrong, what can be improved, and once it's been improved, what can you do with it? Like with the breath. Is it too long, too short, too fast, too slow? How about finding some way to get it just right? And then when it's just right, there's going to be a sense of ease, well-being. Then how do you maximize that? How do you maintain that? And in maintaining it, how do you just let it spread? Think of the breath energy going throughout the body. This is another one of his contributions. Is talking about the breath not only in terms of the in and out breath, but this energy flow throughout the body. Because the Buddha says at many points, once there's a sense of ease and well-being, as the mind begins to settle in, you let it spread so that it saturates the whole body. But he doesn't explain how to do that, or what good ways of perceiving the flow of ease and well-being would actually help it saturate the body. And John Lee points out that if you think of the breath as a full body process, I think it's a lot easier for the sense of ease and well-being to spread. The important thing is that you get a sense of what's working and what's just right. And this is where you're developing your own discernment. Because nobody can get into your mind and calibrate things for you and say, just right is 49.3. Or 56.2. And there's no gauge. There's no breath comfort gauge. And it's up to you to learn how to evaluate things. And then learn how to evaluate your evaluation to see when you're being reliable and when you're not. In the beginning, you may not be sure, but you give it a try. Because that's the only way you're going to learn. You try things out, and then you look at the results. And then you make a few changes, and look at the results again. This is where John Fung's two main instructions for meditation come in handy. You observe, which is part of the evaluation, and then you use your ingenuity. If things are not working out, what do you do to change them? Learn to think outside the box a little bit. But over time you get, become a more and more reliable evaluator. You learn to trust yourself, your ability to read situations. 
This is where the practice of concentration can then spread to the rest of your life. Because we start out with the assumption that we're causing ourselves suffering. We've got some bad habits, but we can change. But again, nobody else can change them for us. We have to learn how to step back and evaluate what we're doing. If there's something wrong in our lives, what actions are causing it? Is it the way we think? Is it the way we speak? Is it the way we talk? And if it's the way we think, exactly which thoughts are skillful and which ones are not, which ones are the troublemakers, which ones are the trouble solvers. If you have some confidence in your ability to read your mind or evaluate the mind, then you get more and more confident in the changes that you make. But again, the confidence has to be based on some experience. You don't just put gold stars all over yourself and say, whatever you do, whatever you think is great. That's a lack of evaluation. If you find that you've got a bad habit, you ask yourself, what's going into that bad habit? How do I think about that? How, why do I fall into that way of relating to myself, relating to other people. And what can I do to change? So you try a few changes, see if they work. And if they don't work, you don't get discouraged. You just come back and try again, try again. And try to read the situation so that you can see exactly where are the causes of the problem. It has to be in something you're doing. Now, this doesn't mean that you're totally responsible for everything around you outside. There are people out there doing lots of unskillful things in the world, and you're going to be putting up with a lot of their lack of skill that you can't change. But what you can change is how you respond to all that and the extent to which you actually make yourself suffer from other people's lack of skill. Because the big message of the vulnerable truths is that the suffering that weighs down the mind comes from your own actions. which some people find depressing, means they have to change. But other people find that liberating. They can change, and if they change, they can make a difference. Those are the ones who are going to benefit from those truths. But here again, you're going to have to learn by trial and error, observing exactly what are you doing, what might you change, look around, see how other people behave. And this is why we have Dharma books, to give you some ideas about where the problem might be and some different ways of thinking. All too often we think that what the Buddha taught was perfectly fine for 2,500 years ago in another culture, in another time, but we live in modern times. And so his teachings become quaint. We see them as antiquated, which means we're not getting the most use out of them. We take our own ways of reading the situation too seriously. We're not, not willing to learn from the advice that's freely given by people who are truly wise. Remember when the Buddha was talking to the Galamas, he wasn't just saying, go by your sense of right and wrong or just believe yourself, or even just observe your own actions. He also said, listen to the counsel of the wise. They've got plenty of ideas, plenty of experience. Where did they get their experience? From listening to other wise people and also looking at their own actions, seeing what worked, what didn't work. 
I wouldn't say I'd learned something like that. Learned what worked. They didn't want to just sit on their knowledge. They used it for themselves, and they're happy to share it. Because this is the kind of knowledge that's really good to share. There's so many subjects out there in the world where you share your knowledge and other people can abuse it. I remember when I was teaching English in, in Thailand before I ordained. Every now and then the thought would occur to me, what if the, my students take this knowledge of English and they use it the wrong way? And there's no way to stop them. But the knowledge of the Dharma is specifically designed to be helpful here inside. And you use it, you benefit, and the people around you benefit. It doesn't cause any harm. It can't be used to cause harm, as long as it's genuine dharma. So as you're meditating, remember that your ability to evaluate how things are going, even though it may seem like a disturbance in the mind as you're trying to get it settled down, but it's a necessary part of getting it settled down to get things adjusted so the mind is snug with the body, the mind is snug with the breath. The sense of well-being flows throughout the body. You can really settle in, because you've learned how to evaluate. You've learned how to judge things. You see that this is different from that. The Buddha never said that wisdom sees everything as oneness. He says it, it's a matter of seeing things as separate, and then you see which separate things are related to each other and one another, which ones are not. And then you learn how to use that knowledge. We're not presented with the present moment simply as a, as a done deal. We're shaping it actively as we go through time. So you want to learn how to shape it more and more skillfully. And again, you learn that by evaluating. This active evaluation is the necessary element in any skill. So learn how to evaluate, learn how to evaluate your evaluation. So you can begin to get a sense of when you can trust your reading of the situation, and when you can't, when you have to make improvements. And be confident that improvements can be made. Nobody here has any problems that nobody else has ever had in the, in the history of the world. Nobody here has any problems that people who have been practicing the Dharma in the past haven't had. They were human beings, they had their failings, but they were able to overcome their failings and solve the problems. And always be confident. If they can do it, you can do it. So look carefully at how they did it, and learn the lessons that they have to offer. So you can start developing your own discernment, discernment that you can trust. The discernment that really does make a difference. A difference is all for the good.